want to get right to some breaking news just into the case at 12 newsroom. The U.S. Supreme Court temporarily halting a new Texas law that allows local and state police to arrest migrants who enter the country illegally. It comes just hours after the Justice Department asked the nation's highest court to intervene. Just four days ago, a lower court in Texas blocked the law from taking effect. Then over the weekend, a federal appeals court out of New Orleans upheld the law. The new law, also known as SB4, was set to go into effect on Saturday. Now to the Bear County District Attorney's Office. Continued fallout from conversations between the District Attorney's Office and the Wren Collective. Today, a judge ordered all conversations between that criminal justice reform group and the DA's office be turned over to the defense team for a former SAPD officer accused of shooting a teenager. That case was talked about in those messages between the DA's office and the Wren Collective. As our Eric Hernandez reports, the state argued these conversations were private and not relevant in an upcoming change of venue hearing. That doesn't mean that they're admissible. Uh, at least you have them. Today, District Court Judge Joel Perez ordered messages discussed about the case against former San Antonio police officer James Brennan be turned over to the defense as a push for a change of venue. Text messages we published last month showed years of conversations between D.A. Joe Gonzalez, his first assistant D.A. Christian Henriksen, and the founder of the criminal justice reform group, the Wren Collective, Jessica Brand. Among the items discussed in those messages, the incident involving Brennan. In October 2022, then-officer Brennan shot 17-year-old Eric Cantu in a McDonald's parking lot after identifying Cantu's vehicle from an evading arrest case. Records obtained by KSAT show that on the same day the DA's office rejected charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and evading arrest against Cantu, Brand texted Henriksen recommending Gonzalez hold a press conference to announce the dropping of charges and to state the incident had harmed public trust. But in today's hearing, an attorney representing the Wren Collective appeared on Zoom arguing the messages were not relevant. Those private communications, communications which necessarily, by virtue of their being private, could not and did not affect the public. The state echoed the same, but the defense fired back. I'd like to point out that there's no right to privacy in communications made with public officials concerning public matters. It's a point Gonzalez himself made in an interview with us back in January. Any electronic device that I use, whether it's personal or or work, uh, is subject to open record. So there is no distinction. That change of venue hearing is expected to take place this Thursday. That is when the judge will decide whether this case will move to another county or stay right here in Bear County. At the Kathina Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. Now to an update on the death penalty case of a man accused of brutally attacking his ex-wife and two young daughters. Jury selection has been set for October 11th for the trial of Stephen Clare. In April of last year, Clare was accused of shooting his ex-wife several times and then stabbing his two young daughters. His 11-month-old daughter, Willow, was killed. This happened at a home near Alamo Heights. Jury selection in that death penalty case usually takes three to eight weeks to complete. Once the jury is seated, a trial date will then be scheduled. There were two missed opportunities to find a gun on a suspect who shot and killed himself during a strip search inside the Bear County Jail. Yesterday, Sheriff Javier Salazar told us a gun should have never made it into the jail. We checked San Antonio police protocol, which confirms officers who transport suspects to the Bear County Jail are responsible for any weapon or contraband on those suspects. Today, SAPD sent a report and press release saying the officer did search 19 year old Jesus Gonzalez before taking him to the jail. They clearly missed the gun, which we're told was in his shorts under a baggy pair of pants. It's a secure facility. I mean, literally nobody is armed, not even us. So absolutely, the, the weapon should have been found before it got to that point. Today, we also confirmed that when any suspect gets to the jail, they are patted down. That BCSO pat down didn't find the gun either. It was during a strip search when he was down to just shorts that he pulled the gun and turned it on himself. SAPD says they are conducting an internal investigation, have not told us whether any officers are facing disciplinary action. 
Today, rescue crews found the body of an 80-year-old man at Lake at Calaveras Lake. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar says the man was using a casting net when he lost his balance and fell into the water. This happened yesterday about 5 o'clock. Search crews say the man got tangled in that net and drowned. Authorities have not identified him, but his family says that he was Antonio Martinez Zambrano. Sheriff Salazar reminds everyone it is important to wear a life vest while in a boat, no matter how old you are. Fire crews in the Texas Panhandle continuing to battle several wildfires across that region. Ranchers in that area, they're hurting as thousands of livestock have been lost in these fires. For many of the cattle that have survived, there's no grass to eat and there's no water. Some of the surviving livestock are also suffering from burns and other conditions like pneumonia. The Texas Panhandle produces around 28% of the beef supply in this country. So the impact of these wildfires could be felt across the nation even long after those fires have been extinguished. It takes years to put a cow herd together before they're productive and producing like they should be. It's going to take maybe decades to get over this. The Texas A&M Forest Service is investigating the cause of the fires. At last check, they have not pinpointed one yet. And speaking of the Forest Service, they provided an update on the current fires. Right now, you can see the Smokehouse Creek fire near 1.1 million acres burned, only 15% contained. The Windy Deuce fire has burned more than 140,000 acres. It is 55% contained. And the Grapevine Creek fire has burned nearly 35,000 acres and it is 60% contained. Let's get to meteorologist Adam Kasky right now. Adam, you've been watching conditions there. The Panhandle had a cold front move through, mm -hmm. so could that help crews battle these fires? A little bit. It'll help some. The fire risk isn't extremely high. It's moderate to high as we go into tomorrow, but I want to start with some satellite imagery, okay? I'm going to zoom out. We're looking at the state of Texas, and look at the burn scar. You can see it from NASA satellite imagery, the burn scar right up there in the Panhandle, just north of Amarillo, this dark area from Canadian westward, just north of Pampa, that is the burn scar. And for comparison, let's go back before the fire. Can't really, it just looks, you know, brown. But then you really see the burn scar when you go back to the most recent satellite imagery. So fascinating images there, unfortunate situation. Here's a look at the fire danger for tomorrow. It's moderate to high in this area it just north of highway 40 or interstate 40 i should say in the panhandle what the main factors that are taken into account relative humidity how much moisture is in the air relative to how much the air can hold and as we go through the night tonight and into tomorrow morning as usual relative humidity is going to increase and get up to the 70 to 80 percentile range which is not bad. That's good actually to help out. And then it drops again a little bit into tomorrow afternoon. Maximum wind gusts up there only about 15 miles per hour. So that's an improvement as well. We'll be back to talk about our erratic temperatures for this week and our next cold front in just a bit. All right. Thank you, Adam. We'll check out traffic right now and let's go to I-10 at Cincinnati. And I believe we're looking at the eastbound lanes of I-10 the lower ramp and you can see it is very slow going both the upper and lower ramp heavy traffic and you know as you head towards downtown is where they come together and i think that's what's slowing down traffic much like the city it serves san antonio international airport is growing 2023 was the busiest year yet in its 80 year history more than 10.6 million passengers now san antonio international instance in municipal airport focusing on the future as max massey explains that starts with a fresh look. With the exponential growth that we've been experiencing, with all the beautiful things that the teams have been able to accomplish, it's about time we start getting ready to be a large hub airport in this city as well. Kind of cozy. Um, it's uh, very nice that you can get in, get out very fast. Those points make San Antonio International Airport an award-winning destination. But as the city grows, so does progress here. <laughs> The rebrand is about momentum. Jenna is the CEO of Greater SATX, an organization aiming to bring businesses and jobs to the San Antonio area. She says her group is thrilled for what is to come. New era means new terminal, means 17 new gates, means a whole lot more air service capacity. When we have greater air service capacity, we have more jobs, greater jobs in San Antonio. I think it uh, captures the spirit of 
of uh, our hopes and aspirations of air service in San Antonio. The rebranding comes as the airport prepares to add more direct international flights and a new terminal set to open to the public in 2028. A terminal complex that's going to be focused on accessibility, sustainability, um, innovation. As for the new logos, the city's director of airports tells me they represent all that is on the horizon. We wear it on our chest every day. Uh, you know, it's on our hearts, it's on our sleeves of who we are and what we do. We're a 24-7, 365 operation. Given the airport's growth through the pandemic and really over the last five years, Jesus Sainz is optimistic that this is just the start of something special. I really wanted to make certain that San Antonio as a medium-sized airport is on the map. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Tomorrow is election day, and here are a few reminders before you head out to the polls. They will be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And remember, as long as you are in line before the polls close, you are still allowed to cast a ballot. And if you need a ride to a polling location, VIA is offering free rides to all eligible voters. And KSAT will have complete coverage of elections and some early results for races here in San Antonio and the surrounding area. Join Myra and myself for our KSAT Super Tuesday live stream tomorrow night starts at 7. Yes, we will have the power panel. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, coverage will be available on all of our streaming platforms tomorrow starting at 7. And if you want to check out a sample ballot for both the Democratic and Republican primaries, scan this QR code that will take you to our Vote 2024 page on KSAT.com. That's where we also have a list of voting locations and a reminder about those hours. Also want to talk about something happening later this week. Doc Talk. We're going to take your medical questions to local doctors and get their answers. Scan this QR code to send in questions for the doctors. Doc Talk airs every Thursday on the news at 630. Still ahead on the news at six, lawmakers on Capitol Hill are again trying to avoid a partial government shutdown. The bills being introduced to help keep the government funded long term. Plus, see how TxDOT is trying to teach college students about the dangers of drunk driving through interactive games. You've heard of beer goggles? Oof, yeah. But first, a quick look outside with live cam. Chance of rain could be on the way later this week. Meteorologist Adam Caskey will have your full forecast after the break. Mental health services historically costly and less accessible for people living on the city's east side. But temporary safe haven has been reversing that trend as of late tonight at 10. What needs to be done to make this special service a permanent one? A creative youth arts program is celebrating 30 years of giving back to the community, but now they're faced with a financial struggle. Tonight on Lightbeat, we hear from SACE's executive director and how you can help. For the second time in two weeks, lawmakers are scrambling to avoid a partial shutdown as another funding deadline looms. Today, lawmakers revealed six bipartisan bills that would prevent another shutdown. The bills give funding to government agencies and departments, including military and veterans affairs. Still, lawmakers are at an impasse over border security and aid to Ukraine, Israel and Gaza. A shutdown is a loser for the American people. We're getting the government funding done and then we're going to turn to these other priorities. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Lawmakers have until March 22nd to pass the deal and keep the government funded for the rest of the fiscal year. As many area college students get ready for spring break, TxDOT trying to help them learn about the dangers of drunk driving. This afternoon at UTSA's campus, students took part in different games while wearing goggles that impaired their vision. Some of the games included a driving simulator, basketball. Students also got to hear stories from survivors of drunk driving incidents. One student we spoke with says this event had an impact on him. You're not able to focus. You're not able to see clearly. You clearly do not have the right capacity to be operating a vehicle that could basically fatally impact somebody's life. So According to TxDOT, during spring break last year, 44 people were killed in drunk driving crashes. We had sunshine, we had clouds, a little bit of both, but just no rain to talk about. We're still waiting for that, Adam. Yeah, we're waiting. Uh, our atmosphere is too capped today. You know, it's kind of like if you had a bottle of Topo Chico and you <laughs> shook it up and your bottle opener wasn't quite strong enough to get it to fizz all over the place you know we just don't have enough to break through that cap in the atmosphere despite some instability 
All right, let's talk about our headlines. Pushing 90 tomorrow, lower humidity, and then more erratic temperatures. They're going to be up and down, a bit of a roller coaster ride again as we have become accustomed to over the past several weeks. Let's take a look at our storm chances. Of course, we need rain around here. Up to about 40% on Thursday. That's late Thursday. Thursday night and even early Friday and then later on on Friday the rain chances drop off. So that's really our next bet or chance for any shower activity. It would be some scattered thunderstorms that could develop and if it does verify and they they can break through the cap that we'll have late Thursday, there's the potential for a strong to severe storm or two. So something we'll watch today. The activity East Texas stretching into Louisiana and moving into Arkansas and even Mississippi. Now this was good soaking rain for them. I'd love to be able to just uh, pull that our way, but right now so far it's just not our time. There's a little ripple in the upper level flow that's helping to cause that not enough to kickstart showers and storms here, but we've got significant cloud cover as a result of it. Our next system that's going to throw some energy our way. That's still in the Pacific. This is west of San Francisco. This upper disturbance with its rain making energy will dip down into the southwest US and the desert southwest and start to give us a little bit of upper level support by late Thursday and Thursday night through early Friday morning. And we should have enough instability that we could generate some storms as long as we can break through that cap. As for the overall generalized precipitation potential, rainfall mainly around here, uh, we're still on the edge of really seeing much. Most of it over the next seven days would be closer to Waco, Dallas, uh, Texarkana and Tyler, Bryan area. Around here, we're still just on that edge, unfortunately. And we're a part of Texas that needs the rain really the most, us and far west Texas. 67, let's talk temperatures. This morning, 67. This afternoon, 81. A little spring-like, but even more spring-like into tomorrow. Notice a cold front that dropped through the panhandle. We touched on this earlier. Amarillo down to 59 degrees. Lubbock, though, at 73. So a big temperature difference here. That front, this is not going to be the front that affects us this week. This is going to drop southward slowly, stall, get a little lazy, wash out, and kind of turn into just just disappear basically from the map essentially over through tomorrow and into Wednesday. Locally, we've got temperatures in the 70s right now. Tomorrow, it's going to be a different story. We're going to wake up to the mid 60s in San Antonio, some 50s in the hill country. But by the afternoon, we're right up near 90 degrees. Noon at 78, 89 our high temperature. We could very well have our first 90 degree day, of course. What's well, a degree amongst friends? You don't feel the difference between 89 and 90. 90 would just be our first official 90 degree day so far this year. And I do think uh, some locations will hit 90. You go west of town, Sabinal, Hondo, 90 degrees, Pleasanton, Poteet, a high temperature of 90. And along the Rio Grande, probably lower 90s. And then we start dropping again. And our, we'll bottom out for afternoon high temperatures this weekend, right near 70. That's it. That's the warmest we'll get over the weekend is 70 degrees despite a lot of sunshine. So that cold front that moves through late week will impact it. Dewey's right now are in the 60s, so we feel it. But notice the dew points drop off for tomorrow and then they come back up again for one day Thursday. That helps us out a little bit with those storm chances we were talking about it. And it's going to affect morning temperatures. You know, our days are limited this time of year where we still have these crisp mornings in the 40s. Mid 40s for lows by Sunday after we lose an hour of sleep and on into Monday morning. So there will still be a little bit of a chill. Can you tell I'm a little, uh, yeah, I don't like daylight saving. I can tell. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think people at home got to see you move your head like you did, but I could, <laughs> that's yeah, what kind of gave it away to me that you were disgusted by the whole thing. I'll yeah. stay on camera next time. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks, Adam. All right. Shaquille O'Neal had a big part in building this program. Yeah, so the Cole Cougars, I believe this is their 10th trip to state, and they've won two state titles, one back in the day, of course, with Shaquille O'Neal, won a couple of years ago, the Cole Cougars getting ready for the 3A state semifinals, and they have a tall task. Plus, plus it's time to meet more San Antonio sports basketball all-stars coming up.
after every game, we go to Canes and bond over there. I get the uh, Caniac, and then I get the substitute the coleslaw for an extra piece of toast, and then I get another extra side of fries. So that's what I get from Canes with the Coke on the side. So it's got to be a Caniac combo, and then definitely an Arnold Palmer. That's like the team favorite right there. Canes plus Cole equals a trip to the state tournament in big board sports. The boys high school basketball state tournament is this week and the Cole Cougars are heading back to the big dance looking to win their third state title in school history. We went to practice this afternoon to get a sense of how the Cougars are feeling before their 3A state semifinal showdown against Hitchcock and having some experience with being in the tournament and winning it all back in 2021 is definitely paying off for the seniors who remember that run. When I was there a couple years ago, I was led by my brother Trey and Dre Ray. So, you know, I wasn't the head of the pack, but now I'm the head. So, like, it's great being able to show these guys how it is, you know, give them a great, great experience. I can kind of relate to what a lot of these guys have been through because some of them started on JV. I played with some of them on JV. And I also played with, like, Trey, Silas, Dre Ray, and they helped me become a better player. And I can just use that experience to help these guys be ready for the moment and be ready to step up and do what they do. What they do. We're trying to prove a point that we could do it. New team, new people, younger people. We're just trying to build each other up. We're just ready to win. It's a top five matchup on Thursday, 3 p.m. at the Alamo Dome. Cool. Cole is the number three team in Texas, and Hitchcock is number one team in 3A and the defending state champs. The Veterans Memorial Boys basketball team punched their ticket to state by winning two games this past weekend to claim the Class 5A Regional Championship. The Patriots will next play Colleen Ellison in the Class 5A state semis Thursday at the Alamo Dome. Now, before that, we plan to talk with the Patriots and have that for you in the next couple of days. And these sweet looking trophies will be handed out to the four winning teams later this month as part of the first ever San Antonio sports all star basketball game going down at Northside Sports Gym on Sunday, March the 24th, live on KSAT 12. Now it's time to meet more all stars from Team Black representing Floresville, Uvalde and Lytle. These student athletes are happy to make the team rep their school and their community. And you know what? It's awesome to see their hard work paying off. Great. Uh, awesome when I heard about it. Yeah. I was really happy. Good. Um, I mean, my dad really put me through hard work, and I'm really happy to be here, and he's happy for me to be here. Excited, you know, seeing all the different talent that there is out here. A lot, you know, what my community's been through, I feel happy to support them. Yes, sir. It's amazing. It's a good feeling. And uh, to be with my teammate, Connor Parkinson, is awesome. The hard work, uh, hours and hours in the gym, you know, putting in work with my teammates, my coaches. I want to thank my coach for putting us in the gym and doing what we do. I mean, I'm excited. I'm very um, excited to just show what I have, and especially with my community has been through, too. Just proud. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's going to be a cool experience. Um, it feels really good. It's amazing to be here, having the opportunity, knowing that my hard work paid off just to be here. Uh, it feels, it's going to be really good because I'm going to be the first one ever to be here, so it's going to be really good. In three weeks, it's the first ever high school all-star basketball game. Four games, eight teams, a skills challenge, a three-point contest. You can get all the ticket info and Dave's schedule by going to the all-star basketball section of ksat.com. And we're going to have a lot of stuff that day. we got all of kinds of things going on. That broadcast. Yes, basketball stuff. Yeah, I taped some stuff today. You did? Yeah. I did. I heard yeah, about the stuff. Got to keep it under wraps. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back. They aren't even in this race. They're not on the ballot. But the governor, Greg Abbott, and the attorney general, Ken Paxton, are trying to influence who you vote for tomorrow, especially if you're a Republican. Scott Braddock is with the Quorum Report. He joins us as he often does. Scott, thank you for your time right here before Election Day. Talk about why mm -hmm. the governor and the attorney general are going after fellow Republicans in this primary. OK, I'm going to answer that and I'm also going to tell you, um, you know, how it's playing out there. So with the governor first, he, of course, is going after Republicans like Steve Allison, who's a state representative in San Antonio, uh, because Allison and other Republicans that the governor opposes voted against a school voucher bill last year, a school voucher proposal on the Texas House floor. Um, but the governor is not attacking those uh, members of the House based primarily on that issue instead. He's saying that they're weak on the border. I'll come back to that. The attorney general is going after Republicans, a much larger number of Republicans who voted to call him out for corruption in his office and infidelity on his part. Um, and the attorney general 
his endorsing candidates who are taking on those who voted to impeach the AG. And, you know, in that race and in that in that case um, and in those races, uh, Steve, it's interesting that in a lot of ways, the attorney general's attacks on Texas House Republicans are largely more honest than what the governor is doing, because the attorney general is talking about these folks who went after him. And because he's talking about uh, the impeachment, the attorney general is having to talk about all the alleged corruption, those allegations against himself and the allegations of infidelity. And I don't think that's playing very well uh, in a lot of Republican districts. For the governor, it's what he's doing is more dishonest because he's going after those Republicans who voted against him on vouchers, but he's attacking them on the issue of the border, an issue on which all of these Republicans, including someone like Steve Allison, they all voted lockstep with the governor. Uh, on anything to do with immigration and border security. So why then focus on that? Why not talk specifically about the disagreement over school vouchers? That is the million dollar question. Here's the million dollar answer. Ready? Because Republican primary voters across the state and in the last two months, I have been everywhere from Abilene to Nacogdoches, DFW, Houston, San Antonio, and everywhere in between. And when I talk to voters out there, they don't care about school choice and school vouchers. It's just not something they're fired up about at all. Polling reflects that, by the way. Um, The border just really outshines uh, any of these other issues in such a big way. Immigration and border security, almost always number one uh, with Republican primary voters. So what the governor's doing is smart politics. He's going after these Republicans who voted against him on school vouchers. But what he's he's looking into the camera and he's in some of these TV ads and he's saying, I can't trust this candidate, this House member to help me secure the border and the person I need instead. And then he points to the person that he has endorsed. So it may be something that works, um, but that doesn't mean it's not just an outright lie. Well, it's certainly a test of his popularity, is it not? It, within yes, Republicans it to see if he can have this kind of influence on the race. Uh, it's not unprecedented. I mean, he did. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a couple of Republicans that he went after, including Lyle Larson locally mm-hmm. way back when. That wasn't particularly effective. But I don't remember the ads like we have seen in this race in particular. Yeah, you know, and I was at those rallies as well back in 2018 uh, when the governor was uh, upset with Lyle Larson and uh, a representative at the time named Sarah Davis in in Houston. Um, and the the issue of the border had not become the thing that was defining Greg Abbott. Uh, and it, now you see real energy uh, at his events. So people are very fired up. Republican primary voters very fired up. Uh, to support whoever the governor says uh, will be the most effective fighter when it comes uh, to the border. So uh, the way, the one way to think about it is that he's accruing political capital on the issue of the border and border security, and he's spending a lot of it against these House Republicans who voted against him on school vouchers. So with the governor making ads against Steve Allison in support of his opponent, Mark LaHood, what's your read on that race in District 121? I have to tell you, Myra, this, you know, compared to past Republican primaries, um, when I talk now to um, consultants and the candidates themselves um, and uh, people who are working on the campaigns, the campaign managers and volunteers who are on the ground in these districts day after day after day, I've never in in almost 25 years of doing this, I have never um, had so many of those folks just say that they're flying blind, that they don't know Mm. what's going to happen. And, And the reason for that is because if you look out across um, you know, all of the state and, and in that district you're talking about with Steve Allison versus LaHood, uh, there have been all of these uh, endorsements that couldn't have been um, you know, maybe foreseen previously that, uh, that, not, that a lot of people who watch politics closely and Republican primary voters um, would not have thought that the governor would actually go campaign against some of these people, would actually you know, be cutting ads saying, uh, that you need to get rid of this person, as somebody who you know has been voted uh, into office by a lot of these same people uh, for so long. And the other uh, thing that that makes this really hard to predict and figure out um, is that the turnout has been so low. Um, yeah. and, and you know we've had obviously you know low turnout elections before. Um, on on the one hand, you might think that because uh, those folks who are turning out are not new voters, and you can see that in the data, a lot of the Republican primary voters that that we're seeing turn out now, are those who have voted in GOP contests before. It's not anybody who's, there are some, but largely it's not new people who are coming in. Um, You might think that that means they'll vote for the same person they voted for before, the incumbent, somebody like Allison. Um, But I'm also uh, maybe a little skeptical of that because when you have low turnout, a lot of times it's the most extreme, most dedicated voters. Those are the kind who I would say would be uh, the kind of Republican voter who would crawl through broken glass in the rain 
to vote for Donald Trump or Ted Cruz, somebody like that. Yeah, very interesting, though, that you, that you don't have a real read on some of these, that a lot of the watchers are even like, we don't know, because it is so unprecedented to see a governor especially go after uh, his own party members like this. I, I, before we let you go, I want to switch and mm -hmm. talk about the Democratic Senate yep. primary that we have tomorrow. Colin already spent a lot of money. We've seen it on our mm -hmm. airwaves here. Roland Gutierrez doesn't have nearly that much money to spend. Do right. you think this is going to a runoff or do you think that we're going to see a winner tomorrow in the Democratic Senate primary? I'll give you a quick history lesson. Go back to 2014 when Wendy Davis was running for governor and she ended up running against Greg Abbott. In the Democratic primary, uh, you saw that candidates with Hispanic surnames um, outperformed her in the Valley uh, in uh, South Texas. Um, and in 2018, when Beto O'Rourke was going to end up running for U.S. Senate against Ted Cruz, um, the same thing happened. Uh, you had uh, those with Hispanic sur surname surnames with no money outperforming in the Valley. And now what you have, very interesting, if you look at the uh, early voting uh, turnout so far, you look at the map of Texas, where are people voting uh, in the Democratic primary? It's in the Valley, South Texas counties that are south of Interstate 10. Um, and so even though Gutierrez doesn't have that much money, as you said, he certainly couldn't compete on the airwaves uh, with somebody like Colin Allred. He has that Hispanic surname. Of course, they know him in South Texas as the senator who represents the Uvalde area and has been on national TV talking about that uh, for the last couple of years. So I wouldn't count out a runoff uh, at all. I think it might be likely that we see that. Very interesting. Of course, former San Antonio City Councilman as well. So we know Roland Gutierrez very right. well. Scott Braddock, always appreciate your time. I know you have a busy <laughs> yes. 24, 36 hours ahead of you. So always appreciate it's, you making time for us. It's so close to being done. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Co watch it. Yeah, watch him. Read what he writes on the quorum report. He's got a great uh, article on there right now about the Abbott effect that he's seeing out and about. Scott, thank you. Thank you all very much. All right. We'll be right back. The spring already in the air, that means spring cleaning is on a lot of to-do lists. <laughs> well, good news. Retailers are marking down prices on some things to help you tackle the job. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with a few of the mo this month's deals that won't clean out your wallet. Spring has almost sprung, so retailers are shifting their focus. Retailers are shifting their focus to spring cleaning and outdoor activities as March rolls in. Shoppers can expect to see discounts on cleaning products, outdoor tools, and all the things they might need to do any home renovations. Consumer Reports found some top-tested products for this month's best time to buy. Think spring cleaning. This shark cordless stick vac is on sale for $400 for a couple more days at Lowe's. That's $100 saved. Next, to fend off the spring sneezing, an air purifier can help with those allergies. The Blue Air Blue Pure 211 iMax is $69 off at blueair.com. CR says it does a good job removing dust, smoke, and pollen. Now to the outside. You can tidy up the yard with a new string trimmer. CR recommends this Milwaukee string trimmer. We found it for $260 at Walmart. The second week of March is Sleep Awareness Week. What that means for you as a shopper is you'll see lots of deals on things like mattresses, bedding, pillows, and sleep accessories like alarm clocks and sleep masks. If you snooze, you lose. Already, the original Casper pillow is on sale for about $57 on Amazon. CR likes its breathability. And if you need a new mattress, too, the Denver Mattress Doctor's Choice Plush is on sale for $760 at Denver Mattress. That's for a queen size. Some things to wait on, appliances like refrigerators and dishwashers. You'll typically see those deepest discounts around Memorial Day. That's when many of them will also be sales tax free. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. I would just like to say that I am always aware of my sleep. <laughs> or the lack <laughs> yes. of. Yes, uh, I still, am as well. Your kids are still at that age. I mean, they're up and ready before oh, sunrise. Yes, and there's no easing into it. Feet hit the floor, they're ready to roll. <laughs> you hear that? Patter, pat, pitter, patter, pitter, patter, pitter, patter, pitter, patter, pitter, patter. Yep. They're, they're ah, good stuff. So it's unseasonably warm this evening, and tomorrow's going to be very spring like. We'll get into that, but I want to show you more uh, about the Texas wildfires and the big burn scar up in the panhandle. I've got the satellite imagery, but also an overlay comparison of the size of it relative to our area here around San Antonio. I'll see you in just a bit. There are wildfires of historic proportion so big 
You can see it from outer space. Yeah, this is pretty wild, Adam. Yeah, it is, and it's a really good visual just to see how far reaching these wildfires are up in the panhandle. Of course, the largest in Texas recorded history since we've been able to, you know, measure them in different ways and different kind of monitoring. But let's take a look at the satellite imagery. And I did show you this earlier in the newscast. If you missed it, it come around to your TV if you're not watching. We're looking at Texas here. This is NASA imagery. I'm going to zoom into the panhandle and you really see the burn scar just north of Amarillo. Let me go back a few days before the fires. Now during the fire before and during. So just north of Highway 40, that's where we have the big burn scar and I can go even tighter on it there. That brown, that dark area, couple of the different fires. Now, here's the latest on that the, from the Texas Forest Service. We still have estimated almost 1.1 million acres burned in the Smokehouse Creek fire, only 15% contained. Then we have got the Windy Deuce fire, 144,000 acres, 55% contained in the Grapevine Creek fire, that's 60% contained. I do have good news in the sense that conditions will be improving to help fight these fires over the coming days later this week. Now let's take that burn scar, same size, and put it over our area. It would stretch from beyond Seguin all the way to Hondo. So just think of it as essentially Seguin to Hondo and then north to south, basically 1604 on the far north side to 1604 on the far south side. So this wow. is a good visualization to just realize how big that burned area is. Of course, we need more rain around here. Yes, we do. We've got the extreme drought, especially in the hill country. But you go to the panhandle, ironically, they're not in a drought right now. So they're not in a drought situation. They just had conditions that were very favorable to spread a fire should one start. This was last week. And unfortunately, one did start. And with their 60 mile per hour winds and very dry air, here we have it now. The rain today was East Texas now moving to the Mississippi River, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, all getting that action. Our next swirl right here west of San Francisco, that's going to drop in and give us a 40% chance by Thursday. Now these chances probably will be tweaked a little bit over the next few days, so check back in for updates. But that would be late Thursday on into Thursday night and early Friday. It's actually a cold front on the panhandle. It's not going to make it here, but Amarillo 59, Lubbock 73. You see that temperature difference there. We're in the 70s right now. Unseasonably warm. We'll be above average. Tomorrow morning, upper 50s in some outlying areas. 58 Bernie, 58 Rio Medina in Hondo. Locally in San Antonio, about 64 at sunrise. And then we quickly warm up. Very spring-like tomorrow right near 90 for the afternoon high 91 Catula and Carrizo Springs making it to 89 tomorrow in Converse and looking ahead those mornings get cooler back in the 40s Sunday morning after we lose an hour of sleep <laughs> still the head bob yeah with the sass note the shark has a lot of sass a lot of eye roll going on all right thanks coming up we're gonna talk about river bombs and swifty songs in Ooh, the you got me <laughs> To the buzz and an unusual and potentially dangerous discovery in a Massachusetts river, a magnet fisherman pulled an object he thought was a mortar out of the Charles River. But the Massachusetts State Police say this is a military projectile. A bomb squad says it was about a foot long. It was severely deteriorated. They were able to get rid of it without any issues. Scary catch, though. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, Taylor Swift's songwriting skills may be somewhat genetic. The performer is related to famed poet Emily Dickinson, according to the company Ancestry. Officials there posted a statement saying that Swift and Dickinson are sixth cousins, three times removed. Not sure what that means, but Swift mentioned Dickinson's influence during her 2022 acceptance speech for the Songwriter Artist of the Decade Award from the Nashville Songwriters Association International. And in what may or may not be a coincidence, Swift's upcoming album is titled The Tortured Poets Department. Is this an Easter egg? Does this mean she knew? Oh my gosh. I don't know. Kasky says it doesn't count. It doesn't count. <laughs> we'll be right back. You far removed. Nope. The countdown is on 35 days until the total solar eclipse. Ooh, let's just hope there's no cloud cover, okay? 
That's, that's, that's what I get nervous about and think about when I'm trying to sleep at night. <laughs> April 8th eclipse will rank among the top 25% of eclipses in terms of duration. It's, yes, a very good one because it's going to last longer than what you would typically have for totality because the moon is a bit closer to Earth than usual. That would be the thing that makes you nervous. We finally found it. Yeah. That's it. We know. It's <laughs> part of it. Thanks for watching. See you at 10.